How I quit after I got fired and unfired. In my last post, I shared the story of how I got fired in a huff by someone who, to put it diplomatically, overestimated his own authority, only for my termination to be rescinded by his manager a few hours later when she found out about it. This one is the follow-up, set a year later, and is the story of how I finally ended up quitting that job. Cast of characters, me. I was a lead sysadmin at a very large telco, responsible for the email system at the corporate HQ. I was a contractor there, which will become relevant to the story later. Jim, Jay in my last story, an IT architect at a large telco. Jim was my primary customer contact until he flew off the handle and tried to fire me under circumstances that were dubious at best. Jim was a pretty smart technical guy who was also a bull in a china shop who shouldn't have been allowed to work around other people. People. Lynn, not in the previous story, Lynn is the IT architect who I was assigned to work with after Jim screwed the pooch in my previous story. She was awesome, for reasons that will become clear soon. She reported to Jim, and utterly loathed him. Marie, M in the previous story, Jim's boss, the IT department manager. She unfucked everything after Jim fired me. In early 2000, I got a phone call at home from an IT recruiter. This wasn't uncommon at all, I had at one point or another interacted with half the sleazy recruitment agencies in my city. This call was a little bit different. It was from an in-house recruiter for a tech company, a company that was one of the shining stars of tech where I lived, with a reputation for not only having solid technology in their market, but also being a great place to work. They were an honest to goodness unicorn back before anyone called them that. The conversation went something like this. Recruiter, hi Blamp Glorf, this is Recruiter with Cool Tech Company, how are you today? Me, doing well, thanks, what can I do for you? Recruiter, Blamp Glorf, I'm calling because Lynn gave me a copy of your resume, and suggested that I reach out to you about a position we have open. A bog standard HR introductory call followed, where I found out that they were looking for a lead Windows sysadmin for their internal IT department. Now this confused the zucchini out of me, because Lynn was my lead, albeit through a dotted line. Let that sink in, my boss sent my resume to a recruiter without my knowledge or permission. Obviously, this was something that warranted further investigation. So, I called Lynn. Apparently, she had just interviewed at Cool Tech Company, and didn't get the job. On the thanks but no thanks call from HR, she told the recruiter something to the effect of well, that's too bad, but I know someone else you need to talk to. Blemp Glorf is better at this stuff than me, and I think he'd love working at Cool Tech Company. And then she sent over my resume, which she had from when she referred me for an internal hire job in another division of the telco we both worked at. When I asked her why she did that she just said, you have to trust me on this one. I can't say more. So I had a phone interview with the hiring manager at Cool Tech Company. And he and I meshed well, and he decided to bring me in for the full gauntlet interview with the rest of the sysadmin team there. Around this time, I got a meeting request from Jim, who I hadn't really interacted with a lot since the time he tried, and failed, to shit can me. At the meeting, Jim informed me that Telco had decided to insource all the contract sysadmins, and bring them on as direct Telco employees. He had an offer letter waiting for me at the meeting. I opened the offer letter, only to discover that it was a 20% pay cut from what I was earning as a contractor, to do the same job. There was a slight bump in terms of benefits value, from what I recall the 401k match was superior, but at first glance, it was obvious that this was a pay hit no matter how you added it up. Jim also informed me that this wasn't optional, that the insourcing was going to happen whether I liked it or not, and that this was a take it or leave it offer. Not only would this be a pay cut, but I would also be reporting directly to Jim, as would all the other newly insourced sysadmins on the team. Either one of those would be deal breakers, but I kept my mouth shut, knowing his history. I caught up with Lynn a few minutes later. She took one look at my face and knew what had just happened. This is why I told you to trust me, she said, before I even said a word. I could have kissed her. So, a couple of weeks later I went in for the full interview at Cool Tech Company, which resulted in an offer that would have been a no-brainer to accept even if I hadn't just had my pay cut. I received that offer just before the planned effective date of the insourcing, 
and pay hit. The next day, I walked into Lynn's cube and let her know that I'd gotten the job. She got this look of utter delight on her face, and said to me, you have to let me be there when you tell Jim. So, we walked over to his office together, and told him. He looked absolutely flawed, and as usually did when he didn't get his way, immediately went into argument mode. All the other sysadmins took the job. True, but two others quit within the first two months because they didn't have the head start on their job search that I did. You're making a big mistake, and why would that be? Do you think that little company is going to last? They did. Dot. The problem was that because of the planned insourcing, there was no mechanism to continue to pay me past the end of that week, as Telco's contract with the outsourcer was expiring. Enter Marie. Marie was Jim's boss, who I had a great relationship with. Now, I felt genuinely bad about this, because IT operations at corporate HQ was her responsibility, and this left her with not only no email server support, but only a day to figure out how to ensure continuity. My backup had quit for unrelated reasons a month before. I was perfectly willing to give two weeks notice per custom, mind you, they just didn't have a straightforward way to pay me for it. So, Marie called me into her office, after Jim had left for the day. I told her that I was already in the interview process at the time Jim gave me the offer. This was true, although I left out the whole part about Lynn. And the fact that it was such a big pay cut made it a no-brainer to continue the process. Marie had an utterly stunned look on her face, and she said to me, pay cut? You all were supposed to be kept at parity. What I found out later, through my mole Lynn, was that Jim neglected to relay that instruction to company HR when they were preparing the offer letters. They prepared the offers at what HR deemed to be market rate, which in this case was a substantial pay hit. I never found out if he did that on purpose, but given that he'd complained in the past that he thought we were overpaid for what we did, I'd be willing to hazard a guess that he did. Anyway, even though Marie upped the offer to match my current pay rate, so much for take it or leave it, and promised that I'd be reporting to her given my past history with Jim, I still declined as my new job had a lot more long-term opportunity. I ended up taking the job at the telco, just long enough to work out my notice period. HR was very confused at my exit interview when they noticed that I'd been with the company for only 9 working days. Incidentally, I ended up staying at Cool Tech Company for over 8 years. It was the best career move I ever made. My only regret about it was that I was never able to get Lynn a job there. On the other hand, Marie stepped in and took away all of Jim's supervisory responsibility over the sysadmins, sticking him in a strict technical role. He lasted a few months after that and bailed out to a much smaller company. I feel sorry for Marie having to deal with everyone quitting. She seems like a pretty great person, shame she had everything screwed up by Jim. Marie is awesome. She backed me up 100% after the biggest tifu moment of my professional life. Yes that's another story, but I may not be able to post that one for a long while, as it's going to take some serious thinking to figure out how to anonymize it properly. I'll always be grateful to her for that. HR, hey Jim, make sure to keep current employees at parity. Jim, okay, so pay hit. HR, no, Jim, parity. Jim, so pay hit Terry. Butternut Jim and everyone like him. I have a Jim in my life, chemistry, not tech support, that was an absolute banana banana like this guy. Went over my head and tried to sabotage me, would go so far as to talk over me in meetings because he was leading them as the lab director. I left that company because I couldn't stand him and of course better pay. Fast forward a year and he has run the lab into the ground and is looking for new jobs as the lab is beginning to fully fail and I get an email with his new non-compete, resume, etc. Oh, what's this? He's looking for new jobs while working and under a non-compete? Even better, it's with a direct competitor and in direct violation of his non-compete and non-disclosure agreements, the same ones I had to sign. Turns out the idiot had been scanning all of this at work using the company's scanner and didn't bother to change the default email address, 
My personal address I had used to set up the machine since I was the de facto IT person at this small lab. He didn't test the machine before sending it to himself to make sure it was going to his personal email first and boom, landed right in my lap. He called me frantically and emailed incessantly for about a week and I just let him hang in the breeze. That was a very good week as I got to tell the story to my former colleagues and current boss who had all dealt with him and also hated his guts. Oh, that crazy Jim. I guess he went from opening windows to closing doors. Dash. Edit, Reddit Gold. First timer. Who would have thought being an idiot would finally pay off? In your face, mum. Thanks you are wo dude. Company wide email plus 30,000 employees plus auto responders equals. Witnessed this astounding IT meltdown around 2004 in a large academic organization. An employee decided to send a broad solicitation about her need for a local apartment. She happened to discover and use an all employees at org. Edu type of email address that included everyone. And by everyone, I mean every employee in a 30,000 employee academic institution. Everyone from the C CEO on down received this lady's apartment inquiry. Of course, this kicked off the usual round of why am I getting this and take me off a list and omg everyone stop replying responses. Each reply to all employees at org. Do, so 30,000 new messages. Email started to bog down as a half million messages apparated into mailboxes. IT fail number one, not necessarily making an all employees at org. Edu email address, that's quite reasonable, but granting unrestricted access to it, rather than configuring the mail server to check the sender and generate one not the CEO equals not authorized reply. That wasn't the real problem. That incident might have simmered down after people stopped responding. In a 30k organization, lots of people go on vacay, and some of them, let's say 20, remembered to set their email to auto-respond about their absence. The auto-responders responded to the same recipients, including all employees at org. Edu. So, every I don't care about your apartment message didn't just generate 30,000 copies of itself. It also generated 30,000 times 20 equals 600,000 new messages. Even the avalanche of apartment messages became drowned out by the volume of I'll be gone till November auto replies. That also wasn't the real problem, which, again, might have died down all by itself. The real problem was that the mail servers were quite diligent. The autoresponders didn't just send one I'm away message, they sent an I'm away message in response to every incoming message, including the I'm away messages of the other autoresponders. The autoresponse avalanche converted the entire mail system into an Agent Smith-like replication factory of away messages, as autoresponders incessantly informed not just every employee, but also each other, about employee status. The email systems melted down. Everything went offline. A 30k wide enterprise suddenly had no email, for about 24 hours. That's not the end of the story. The IT staff busied themselves with mucking out the mailboxes from these millions of messages and deactivating the autoresponders. They brought the email system back online, and their first order of business was to send out an email explaining the cause of the problem, etc. And they addressed the notification email to all employees at org. Edu. IT fail number two. Before they sent their email message, they had disabled most of the auto-responders, but they missed at least one. More specifically, they missed at least two. And GT, more specifically, they missed at least two. This the greatest punchline this story could have. Did she get her apartment though? Yeah, but she lost the job that paid for it. It's funny this is happening with Time and Life Incorporated right this very second. I've worked at a company with an email address like that. Someone went to the copy machine and scanned their butt and emailed the entire company. Never got caught. Didn't bring down the mail server though. Single instance storage may have saved the day here. It warms my heart to know that computers are still too stupid to stop babbling incoherently to one another. I still have a chance of dying before the robot uprising. They did back then. Outlook now turns on send only one message per person per day by default. Okay, now the password is D35P41R. First post in quite some time. 
I work at a local authority on the hell desk. Social workers are the bane of my existence but you learn to cope with their general incompetence as part of the job. Sometimes they can still surprise you. This happened today. So, we use a generic username for most of our computers so that people can log onto the machine, then from there they log into Citrix to work. Everyone knows the username and password for this. It's literally written on the walls in most areas, because the only thing it can access is another login page, so it isn't a security issue. Most of these accounts stay logged on at all times to save confusing the geniuses that work here. Guy rang up, said hello and asked for the generic login details. I've changed the exact username and password but other than that this is more or less word for word. And GT, genius, so what's the username? And GT, me, it's computer. And GT, genius, so is that the asset number of the PC? And GT, me, no no, it's just the word computer. And GT, genius, and then backslash my name. And GT, me, no, it's the word computer. C-O-M-P-U-T-E-R. Computer. Nothing else. And GT, genius, and what's the password? And GT, me, it's P force word. In, the word password with a capital P, but you replace the A with a 4. And GT, genius, so it's password 4. And GT, me, no, it is not. It is P banana W O R D with a capital P at the beginning. Everything else is lowercase. And GT, genius, okay. So the username is computer force word. What's the password? And GT, me, no. The username is computer. The password is P force word. That's everything. Just two words. Two boxes, two words. And GT, genius, type 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 it didn't work. Typed in password but it's said it's incorrect. And GT, me, spell out what you typed for me please. And GT, genius, P button at W O R D. And GT, me, very slowly and clearly, in case it was my accent or something. Like I said, capital P, number 4, lowercase s, lowercase s, lowercase w, lowercase o, lowercase r, lowercase d. P force word. And GT, genius, type type click no. And it says the account is locked. I used a capital P this time definitely. And GT, me, did you use a 4 instead of the A? And GT, genius, use 4 watts. I remoted to the machine and typed it in for him. Complained that the system was needlessly complicated. I think that user requires percussive maintenance. Edit, thanks for the gold, slash u slash pixelate. And GT, make something idiot proof and they will build a better idiot. My favorite is, and GT, it is impossible to make something idiot proof because idiots are so damned ingenious. Ever since I started reading TFTS I have a small mantra I am repeating every evening before I go to bed, I am so glad that I don't work in tech support. I find it's the little things that make me smile that do it. Like poisoning Gotham's water supply just to coconut with the Batman. I cannot possibly make this any easier, I am literally spelling it out for you. I can explain it for you, but I can't understand it for you. And GT, lowercase w, lowercase o, found the problem. You switched from a lowercase to lowercase in the middle of everything. Of course the poor cheesecake got confused. Not to mention that he was speaking in uppercase.